You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Come on, no! Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, and this is actually an episode that is in lieu of the next level. And before I introduce today's guests, I want to mention that last week's interview was with Bentley Meeker, outrageous New York City-based contemporary artist and lighting designer, really an incredible conversation. And on the next level, I had Sean Lowe of The Business of Being Creative. Both of those were great conversations. And then just this most recent Monday... I had Bruce Russell and Tara Fay, planners and designers out of London and Dublin, respectively. So today's guests are all with the Live Event Coalition, and they are Dwayne Thomas, Chairperson for Government Affairs, Live Events Coalition, and President, Live Events Industry of Oregon, and his company is Greenlight Creative. John Garberson is the Creative Director of Backstage and is the President of the Arizona Chapter of the Live Event Coalition. And Kelsey Rausch does marketing for the Arizona chapter of the LEC and is also co-owner of a wedding business, Honeybee Events. So welcome, everybody. I appreciate you coming on. Um, Just so people get to know your voices and can associate, you know, with your names. Dwayne, if you could uh, maybe say hello, Dwayne Thomas. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Thanks for having us on, Andy. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolute pleasure. And John Garberson, if you could speak for a minute. Hi there. Yeah, Thanks for having us on. And Kelsey, Kelsey Rausch. Hi, Andy. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, I think people will know which one is Kelsey. (laughs) I would hope so. (laughs) That that won't be too difficult. And Dwayne and John, maybe when you first speak for the next uh, for the next couple of minutes, you can just say your first name before so people know who you are. So on October 31st of last year, 2020, uh, I interviewed some members of another chapter of the Live Event Coalition, so I know that a great deal of effort has been going on from a number of fronts. And what I would like to start with is um, talking about the mission of the LEC, of the Live Event Coalition. Um, who would like to begin with that? Well, this is Dwayne. I can take that one a little bit, at least. Not per se reading from our website uh, the exact statement, but I can, I can tell you the goals here are to advocate for the entire live events industry. We're, we're not specific like a lot of groups are to just the, the trade show or the corporate market. And we're not specific to just weddings. Um, we're not specific to just fairs and festivals. In fact, we, we incorporate all of those uh, vertical markets into our sphere, into our ecosystem, uh, including performing arts as well. Anywhere uh, that is an, an organized event that more than 25 people gather, where people are People like us are paid to provide services and products such as planning, producing, um, lighting and AV, staging, transportation, uh, performing arts, all of, all of it. Um, we, we loop the entire sphere under our, our, our tree, our branches, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we're, we're unique in that um, we're not focused on one sector of service or not focused on one vertical market of types of events. Um, it's, it's kind of a broad swath of all of us. Our goal is to advocate uh, for the needs of, of the people and the businesses in this, in this industry. Um, mainly, as you can imagine, for the last year, uh, the efforts have been something like 80% uh, about advocacy, government advocacy, and lobbying. Um, for assistance and for programs that are going to assist our businesses if they, as they've been shuttered. Additionally, we're, we're, there's a lot of education that's, that's happening in there. Um, we, we, we strive really hard for equity uh, and, and inclusion in, in our world, and we, we do a lot of educational pieces regarding that. But we also want to help uh, have sessions with, um, how about insurance? What, what do we do now? Because all of our all of our business interruption insurance turned out to be garbage when it came to a pandemic. So what are we doing about that? And how can we educate you about that? And also, we, we have tried to have little benefits like uh, we do have a group health plan that you can sign up for if you're in the individual market. and It's killing you now that your business isn't really operating. Um, you can get a little break by buying insurance through this group plan. Um, it's kind of that power of numbers sort of thing. We're different from the other uh, organizations in, in a way that we, we don't seek to replace people like ILEA or, or MPI or any of those because they're really very focused on the, the, the annual events that they have or semi-annual regional events that they have. They're very focused on the monthly chapter events that are about education and, and socially, socially um, uh, networking. That's not really our, our game at all. Um, 
also those organizations aren't technically allowed to lobby the government. We are registered differently so that we can. And that's been our core function. Mm. So what is the latest relief bill that uh, is up for a vote uh, or, or actually was already perhaps voted on just last weekend, the weekend of the of the 13th? Well, that would be the American Rescue Plan. Some people call it the Biden plan. We, boy, long story, tried to make it as quick as possible. We knew clear back uh, the second week of January, there wasn't going to be much, much meat on the bones for our industry in this. That was a source of a lot of frustration. Um, We came out of uh, December with a second round of PPP. We came out with an extension, a short extension, literally till just this last weekend of uh, unemployment. And that was great, but we knew our work was cut out for us because the industry wasn't going to be coming back online anytime soon. So when we heard that there was going to be another package back in December, um, we immediately started gearing up and communicating about what was going to be needed from it, not knowing that we were in this perfect storm where the incoming president wanted to get a lot of work done, but was not able to really do the transition in the way that presidents normally transition. So nobody, including Congress, knew what was in his team's plan. Um, and by the time it hit leadership's desk, the, the, the new uh, majority leader, Schumer, and uh, of course, Speaker Pelosi, it was already baked. There was little we could do or say to change it. So we immediately moved on to the next round, which is um, hard to say when that is going to be. But long story short, there's not much in there. If you have a business that's 10 or fewer employees um, and you lost more than 50% of your revenues in 2020, then you're going to get a check for $5,000. If you happen to own a performing arts venue and it meets all the qualifications uh, or you're a talent agency, you already have a program from the last package that they just added more money to. Uh, It has not rolled out and won't roll out, uh, according to the SBA, until the 1st of April. Um, that is called the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant Program. So the SVOG is still being hashed out. And um, well, I'll talk about what we do from here past that. Sure. The other big thing that came out is that it, it, unemployment got extended again until Labor Day, which is going to be estimably great for all of us who have teams who are underemployed or not working at all still. Um, and there's a lot of businesses, business owners that still can take advantage of that. Yeah, I'll tell you the unemployment though, myself included and many friends, uh, it just can't even get through. We're getting locked out of the system for I mean it's a mess. It's a real I've had to write my congress uh, person, senate. It's it's really crazy. It's really complicated. You literally can't get a hold of anyone <laughs> to get help. Yeah, yeah, you can't get through. Yeah, and sadly, the unemployment system is is operated by the states. So there's 50 different states, 50 different unemployment systems. Some are going really well. Right here in Oregon, it was it was awful from about April through, oh, I don't know, uh, September. It, we had people who were getting 16 and 20 checks all in one day. They were just all showing up at once, and, yeah. and you could people waiting online all day to talk to a a virtual assistant, people waiting on hold all day. Right. And then you'd hear stories from Utah or from Connecticut where, no, oh, it's going just fine. I got mine right away. What's the problem? And so there's little we can do to impact all 50 states. It, it's, we've allowed chapters to have those, those arguments and those discussions for sure. And I recommend that you do wherever you are, do reach out to your state house and, and have that conversation. But I'll tell you, you won't be the first that they'll be hearing. It. Yeah. Well, and, and also the May recovery bill, or is that something you, you covered just a few minutes ago, perhaps with a different name? I'm, I'm wondering what you're working on for that. We're trying to have one. This is going to be tougher. The difference between what just happened and what's going to happen next is this. There's a process called reconciliation. That's where they go through the entire operating budget and they basically add stuff to it. That's a, the best way I can put it. And the important part of reconciliation is that it only needs a simple majority to pass. So the people who like to spend money in the Senate now, or and always, tend to be the Democrat side. Well, the Democrats have a one vote margin because they have the tiebreaker with Vice President Harris, right. who's a Democrat. So you're able to get almost anything you want done um, as long as you can get all 50 votes plus Vice President Harris. 
there were a couple of things that want that wanted to happen that a couple of center uh, Democrats did not want and said, then I'm pulling my vote. And so they had to negotiate. For instance, unemployment was going to move to four hundred dollars and it was going to go through September. And uh, Senator Manchin, uh, who is a center center left guy, said, nope, I don't want that and threatened to pull everything. So that got renegotiated in exchange, though, uh, the president came back in and said, well, then we're going to make the first ten thousand two hundred dollars of your unemployment benefits from 2020 not taxable. So that was the trade off. You lost the, the hundred dollar raise a week, but then you gained a, a huge tax break, honestly, for uh, for your 2020 taxes. That was, that was a pretty big deal. Oh, yeah. Um, there is room for another reconciliation process in this year's proceedings. It wasn't slated till fall. So the rumor now is they'll try to push that up because there are still budget issues to be voted on and you can push things through in reconciliation. And failing that, our industry is going to need 10 Republicans in the Senate to, to vote our way, to vote with all 50 uh, Democrats. So that, that's, that's our sleeves rolled up now is about getting bipartisan support. That's where we're at. So what is left to advocate for to support the live events industry surrounding this? Oh, this is Dwayne again. I'm sorry to take all the air here, but where we are now is we have had uh, 35-ish meetings with members of Congress, both in the House and Senate, both parties, um, freshman people, sophomore people, rank and file people. But really, by and large, we're focusing on the the two committees that deal with small business, Senate Small Business Committee, and there's another one in the House. So we've been dealing with mainly those members. We'll, of course, talk to everybody. We, um, Since I'm sitting in the room with two Arizona folks, we've talked to both senators in, in, in Arizona, and that has been very helpful. What we're hearing from these folks uh, repeatedly now is our, our goal ought to be to stump for an amendment to an existing rule rather than to prop up a new program. If we try to prop up a new program, it'll be a year. And and we can't wait a year. We can't make it. That's right. So what we're working on now is a strategy to we've written guidelines for them to amend the SVOG. That's the program for performing arts venues and talent agencies and movie theaters that I spoke of. That passed in the December package still has not rolled out. Um, Hoping they roll it out by uh, the beginning of April. And the great thing about that package is it is going to help one sliver of our ecosystem. If they just reworded who is eligible, it could help us all. Now, the problem is there wasn't really enough money in it to begin with for who it was written for. Um, so where's this money going to get going to come from? That's a hitch we're still working out. Um, I spoke with Senator Merkley from here in Oregon uh, as, as I'm just ironically, I, it's, I almost never talked to my own, my own members of Congress. I'm talking to everybody else's all the time, but I talked to my own last week and and he said, yeah, that money is going to be hard to get. They're all uh, licking their wounds because they just spent more money than they've ever imagined spending a couple of days ago. And but I suggest we find it in an un- underutilized program. So we're looking at all these aid programs that have money sitting in them that, that are virtually it's just growing moss, basically, and hoping for a reappropriation to make the pot in SVOG bigger. And if we can expand the definition of who qualifies, then we'll, we'll be headed home. Once they start giving out those grants, the money goes very quickly. That will change the sense of Congress a lot about how important this money and the, the needs were. And the hope then is that they would go back and, and do a simple reappropriation uh, bill just to add more money to the pot. They, they did that with PPP last year twice. Um, it's, it's a pretty common thing. Doesn't mean it'll happen, but that's what we're stumping for now. I want to be sure you know the wonderful news of our latest show, Stop and Smell the Roses, with acclaimed lifestyle and event design expert, Preston Bailey. Not only will he share the secrets, tools, and technologies behind his extraordinary ability to create a theatrical environment out of any space, you will also discover more about the man behind the magic. Preston will reveal how his focus on personal growth has been the root of his professional success, and you'll have the opportunity for him to answer your questions along the way. Plus, Preston will be inviting onto the show many of the star celebrities he has worked with in the past, so you don't want to miss a single episode. 
We also have another great show on the Wedding Biz Network, The Business of Being Creative, with host Sean Lowe. Since debuting last May, his show has really taken off, and he's continuing to bring you the creative business advice he's shared with accomplished industry notables. Be sure to take advantage of Sean's talkback opportunity by recording questions and comments from right there in each episode's show notes. So, if you are a creative who is turning your craft into a business or want to take it to another level, head to theweddingbiznetwork.com and take a listen to Stop and Smell the Roses with Preston Bailey and The Business of Being Creative with Sean Lowe. That's theweddingbiznetwork.com. John or Kelsey, how can people support the LEC and, and even become a member? No, this is John. Um, I mean, to become a member is easy. Just go to the, the website and there's actually a member uh, link on there that you click on to become a member. And uh, you can actually choose the state that you're actually in. Okay, great. And Kelsey, you know, in terms of your own business, how have you handled the challenges of, of the pandemic on your business? <laughs> So funny enough, I actually started my business in the pandemic. Um, I was laid off from a large corporate event planning company right at the beginning with everybody else. And instead of wallowing, I decided to pick up and use my time um, to start my business. So that's why things like um, unemployment and then these programs um, are so important because I wouldn't have been able to support myself in order to start my business during this pandemic. And I'm so grateful for these programs. But like we were kind of talking about earlier, it's frustrating. It took me three months to even get my back pay of unemployment. And it was a really scary time because I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but you know, the drive is there and I'm trying to um, get things up and running. And I'm starting to see like a light at the end of the tunnel. Things are starting to book um, with a lot of hope <laughs> for yeah. this next year. So we're definitely excited about that. But um, there's still a long way to go with all of the programs and support that we need to keep our industry alive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and John, what about yourself? I mean, in terms of dealing with all the challenges that you've had to face on your business, how's that gone for you? Well, as John, um, I'm in a kind of a, a unique situation. I'm actually um, in 2019, a larger event company made a large purchase, purchase into my company. So I'm actually a, under an umbrella of a larger company that actually has several other companies. Uh, they were able to pivot um, and offer disaster relief uh, during all this. So it was, it was one way to keep the doors open. Um, but at the same time, with Cree backstage, we were dead in the water. We had nothing. So instead of just trying to you know, just sit at the house and do nothing, um, I learned about the Live Vent uh, Coalition and basically started the Arizona chapter up to help us out here in Arizona. Arizona is a little bit different than the other states is because the governor let all the cities individual make the mandates of what's going on. So there's not one person that's doing it. Every city's different. So it makes it very hard out here to figure out what's happening in each city. Um, you can actually have events in Scottsdale, but you go across the street in Phoenix, you can't really have events. But things are changing because uh, our governor, Ducey, just basically opened up the state a couple of days ago. So restaurants are at 100%, but they have to keep distance and masks. We actually had a meeting with Scottsdale mayor uh, last week, and that's interesting feedback from Scottsdale, where he says that all the hotels just regulate themselves. So basically, it's a handshake between the hotel and, and the city saying, I will make sure that I keep my hotel safe. But they're allowed to actually do any sort of volume they want to, but they have to um, make sure everything's safe there. So it actually helps with, uh, you know, like weddings coming up and stuff. So yeah. now weddings can actually happen in Scottsdale. Phoenix actually has something in their policy that any private events is not regulated, doesn't need a permit, and there's no uh, gathering limits Wow, there. Yeah. So we call we call the Arizona the Wild West of events right now <laughs> because it's just crazy what's happening out here. And with Arizona being such like a tourist state, um, we've had a lot of support from like the mayors of all of the different cities and towns because they want to help our industry stay alive so that when everything comes back, tourism can continue at the same pace and the businesses are there to support the cities. Yeah. 
That's wonderful. Um, and Dwayne, what about you in terms of the impact on, on your business and how have you dealt with it? Well, we write, like everyone else, we right away shed our entire schedule. I think that um, we're, we're unique in that we serve all six verticals. Um, we're in performing arts and we're in weddings and we're in um, fundraising events and we're definitely in corporate and trade show. We do some fair and festival works and we do some, some amateur sporting stuff. Um, so we saw it all go away. And the one thing that we hung on to is I believe I, we did three or four micro weddings uh, kind of late August, early September when most states were feeling the most uh, confident, I guess. Um, and we're allowing small gatherings outdoors. So we, we took advantage of that. I think we, uh, of our 85 weddings we had in the books, we kept three, I think. And then we, you know, everybody is talking about pivoting to virtual. Um, I think, you know, certainly anyone in this room, and I don't know if any of the listeners have thought this through, but it is not a pivot that you do and go, great, we have our entire book of business intact. Even the people who are doing it full time, um, one of the guys on our board and one of my great clients is a massive corporate event planning company uh, that we do uh, shows all over the country for. And they went from 136 employees to 12 overnight. Pivoted. Wow. They're doing exclusively now they're doing, oh God, 15 or 20 virtuals a week. And they've hired back up to about 30 uh, because they needed, you know, you need a lot of creatives. You need a lot of camera guys. You need a lot of techs. So they've managed to hire back up a little bit, but they're operating at 10% of their normal revenue level that we did about five or six of those last year. So to give you an idea of the difference, we uh, have an annual fundraiser that we do every year for Cascade AIDS project. It's a, it's an art auction and it's pretty splashy and it draws about six or 700 people. Um, we generally bill out something like 30 to $35,000 for our services every year for that. It's a long time client. This year they went virtual and we, we build out $1,300 for our hmm. students. So yeah. the, the, it is not, we, we, we stopped worrying about it. I'll, I'll tell you that. We, we, we stopped thinking, boy, we better pivot. Boy, we better pivot because everything you can think of to do is so paltry. It's just like, let's start the truck once a week, you know, do all the things you can to, to not let cobwebs grow. We downsized the, the space that we're in so we could save a little bit of money there. And we just got busy advocating. Uh, honestly, the, 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 the answer was never going to be in the pivot. And the answer was never going to be in let's reopen fast. We did reopen fast, kind of. And then it spiked and we closed again. And we're going to reopen fast again. And I hope it doesn't spike this time because I hope we're getting towards some herd immunity here. And I hope that we're getting towards some vaccination. So don't know if we get back open into the, into the, in the summer. I don't know about you, Kelsey, but we have a rocking schedule. 100% weddings. There's nothing else on the books. No inquiries for any other kind of event other than a wedding. Interesting. We, I mean, we're almost totally booked out for fall with weddings, which is super exciting um, for us. We're already booking into 2023 because um, people are looking a little further out. But we've also added some other services to our business just to try to stay afloat during this time. And one of that is that we have a new division called The Colony by Honeybee. And we're partnering with different restaurants in town to do um, small dinner events. So like wine and um, food pairings, because people are craving being out, but they want to do it in a safe, small environment. So that's just one of our pivots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before we close, is there anything else um, anyone wants to say about the LEC? I would say this. I've had the honor of working with these folks uh, uh, up close and personal and being on their board since late summer and was, you know, peripherally involved with them since about late April. I've never met a more committed and hardworking bunch, uh, considering that this is a bunch of faces that you see on Zoom and basically none of us have ever met in person. This is kind of a, a widespread group, a core group of about eight or 10 people and then a, a, a more peripheral group of another 30-ish. Um, uh, folks like John and Kelsey and then there's, I've got colleagues in California and in Nevada and Washington and Connecticut and, and Utah and Colorado and Minnesota and, and New York, New Jersey, on and on and on, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky. Um, I've never seen a group more committed to getting us out of this trouble that we're in. And I will tell you plainly from the bottom of my heart, it's an honor to do the work. It's full-time work for all of us. It, we, we're not looking for accolades. And occasionally we'll need help. But the, the biggest thing we need is to make our voice bigger. If we can keep our coalition strong and keep our lobby loud 
and fill that echo chamber with the truth about what's happening in our industry. You know, our, our, we, we have professional lobbyists that we pay every month to help advise us. And they, one of them said to me one time, he said, this is, you're a unique client. We don't have to work hard with you. The thing about your story that makes it so compelling is that it's 100% true. You don't have to exaggerate. Just say you're right. So th- th- yeah. that's what I would say more than anything is we need your membership. We just do. It isn't, it isn't free. To, none of us are paid. This is 100% volunteer. The only people making any money are our lobbyists, and we need to keep paying them. So I will, I will say as a sort of plea, I suppose, um, please join. Uh, we're doing great work, and we need your voice. And yeah, that would be that would be my pitch. Well, on behalf of us, the industry, people like myself out there, I, I just can't thank you all enough for what you're doing. And again, it is volunteer. And so I appreciate it very much. And I know people listening are too. So thank you for helping us. Um, so let me give out the site, first of all, of the Live Events Coalition. It is liveeventscoalition.org. Again, liveeventscoalition.org. Dot org. Certainly urge you all listening to join. Check it out. And I want to give the contact information for each of my three wonderful guests today. Dwayne Thomas's company, again, is Greenlight Creative, which you can find at greenlight-creative.com. John Garbison's company is Creative Backstage, which you can find at creativebackstage.com. Kelsey Rausch's is Honeybee Events, and her website is myhoneybeevent.com. And all of this will be in the show notes at theweddingbiz.com if you missed any of it. And again, I want to thank you all for joining. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Andy.